I'd like you to imagine the following scene. You're in your house. You've got your car keys in your hand. The lights go out. Power failure. You can't see a thing. You stumble around in your living room and you drop your keys. And you look around for a moment and you realize that you're never going to find them in the dark. But you look outside and you notice that the street lights are on. So in your mind, a light bulb goes off. Hmm. I'm not going to sit around here in the dark and grope around looking for my keys when there's a light on outside. I'm going to go out here under the street light and I'm going to look for my keys. <laughs> Why are you laughing? This, is, this makes a lot of sense. So you're out here and you're groping around and you're looking for your keys and you're looking and looking and your neighbor comes along and says, what happened, Wayne? Well, um, I dropped my keys. Oh, well, I'll help you look for them. And the two of us are now down here looking for our keys and looking. Finally, he says to me, excuse me, but um, where did you drop your keys? Well, um, I dropped them in the house. <laughs> he said, you mean to tell me that you dropped your keys in the house and you're looking for them out here in the street light doesn't make any sense. And I said, well, it doesn't make any sense to grope around in the dark when there's light out here. Now you laugh and you think how silly that is, but isn't that exactly what we do when we have a problem, a difficulty, a struggle that is located inside and we're looking for the solution outside, someplace outside of ourselves. If you are raised on blame, it is a habit for you to reach for this excuse whenever you wish to explain why something is not working in your life. You can, for instance, blame lack of prosperity on a lot of externals, your culture, the stock market, politicians, your parents, lady luck, the greed of others. You can blame illness on heredity in the flu season and bad luck of the environment. Your sour relationships can be blamed on your partners, their inability to love you, your upbringing, or your parents. Your personality can be blamed on your parents, or your genes, or your childhood, or your siblings, or your birth order. And your physical appearance can be the fault of genetics, the food manufacturers, advertisers, or the polluted environment. This is potentially an endless list. The alternative to blame is self-responsibility, becoming an inner directed person. You may not have been taught to consider taking responsibility for the events of your life. But if you are unwilling to discontinue the blame game, you will be unable to initiate your sacred quest. When you are inclined to think that someone else is responsible for your circumstances, take an instant to say a prayer of thanks for the lesson. The lesson is to become aware that you are the one who is experiencing the feeling. You can do this the instant that you recognize yourself playing the blame game. Feel thankful toward those you've let anger you. Give inner thanks for the reminder that the feeling you are experiencing is inside you, not outside you. Say to yourself, I do not want to be right. I want to know the truth. I want my higher self to rule. No one is to blame for how I am feeling. It is my feeling, and I respect that. These kinds of affirmations will lead you to self-reliance and to the way of the sacred quest. Your spiritual soul will then become the guiding light for the remainder of your time in the now here. We are in the midst of enormous individual and global change. I believe that all of us who are living at this time chose to be here to be a part of these changes, to bring about change, and to transform the world from the old way of life to a more loving and peaceful existence. In the Piscean Age, we looked out there for our Savior. Save me, save me, please take care of me. Now we are moving into the Aquarian Age, and we are learning to go within to find our Savior. We are the power we have been seeking. We are in charge of our lives. If you are not willing to love yourself today, then you are not going to love yourself tomorrow. Because whatever excuse you have today, you'll still have tomorrow. Maybe you'll have the same excuse 20 years from now and even leave this lifetime holding on to the same excuse. Today is the day you can love yourself totally with no expectations. I want to help create a world where it is safe for us to love each other, where we can express who we are and be loved and accepted by the people around us without judgment, criticism, or prejudice. 
Loving begins at home. The Bible says, Love thy neighbor as thyself. Far too often we forget the last couple of words, as thyself. We really can't love anyone out there unless the love starts inside us. Living in the Flow The Tao and water are synonymous according to the teachings of Lao Tzu. You are water. Water is you. Think about the first nine months of your life after conception. You lived in and were nourished by amniotic fluid, which is truly unconditional love flowing into you, flowing as you. You are now 75% water, and your brain is 85% water, and the rest is simply muscled water. Think about the mysterious, magical nature of this liquid energy that we take for granted. Try to squeeze it, and it eludes us. Relax our hands into it, and we experience it readily. If it stays stationary, it will become stagnant. If it's allowed to flow, it will stay pure. It does not seek the high spots to be above it all, but settles for the lowest places. It gathers into rivers, lakes, and streams, courses to the sea, and then evaporates to fall again as rain. It maps out nothing, and it plays no favorites. It doesn't intend to provide sustenance to the animals and plants. It has no plans to irrigate the fields, to slake our thirst, or to provide the opportunity to swim, sail, ski, and scuba dive. These are some of the benefits that come naturally from water simply doing what it does and being what it is. The Tao asks you to clearly see the parallels between you and this naturally flowing substance that allows life to sustain itself. Live as water lives, since you are water. Become as contented as is the fluid that animates and supports you. Let your thoughts and behaviors move smoothly in accordance with the nature of all things. It's natural for you to be gentle, to allow others to be free to go where they're inclined to go, and to be as they need to be without interference from you. It is natural to trust in the eternal flow, to be true to your inner inclinations and stick to your words. It's natural to treat everyone as an equal. All of these lessons can be derived by observing how water, which sustains all life, behaves. It simply moves and the benefits it provides occur from it being what it is in harmony with the present moment and knowing the truth of precisely how to behave. What follows is what Lao Tzu might say to you based upon his writing of the eighth verse of the Tao Te Ching. First, when you're free to flow as water, you're free to communicate naturally. Information is exchanged and knowledge advances in a way that benefits everyone. Be careful not to assign yourself a place of importance above anyone else. Be receptive to everyone, particularly those who may not routinely receive respect, such as the uneducated or the homeless or troubled members of our society. Go to the low places, loathed by all men, and have an open mind when you're there. Look for the Tao in everyone you encounter, and make a special effort to have acceptance, gentleness, and kindness course through you to others. By not being irritating, you'll be received with respect. By making every effort to avoid controlling the lives of others, you'll be in peaceful harmony with the natural order of the Tao. This is the way you nourish others without trying. Be like water, which creates opportunities for swimming and fishing and surfing, and drinking and wading and sprinkling and floating and an endless list of benefits by not trying to do anything other than simply flow. And secondly, let your thoughts float freely. Forget about fighting life or trying to be something else. Rather, allow yourself to be like the material compound that comprises every aspect of your physical being. In The Hidden Messages of Water, Masaru Emoto explains that we are water, and water wants to be free. The author has thoroughly explored the ways in which this compound reacts, noting that by respecting and loving it, we can literally change its crystallization process. If kept in a container with the words love or thank you or you're beautiful imprinted on it, water becomes beautifully radiant crystals. Yet, if the words on the container are, you fool, Satan, or I will kill you, the crystals break apart, are distorted, and seem confused. The implications of Emoto's work are stupendous. Since our consciousness is located within us, and we're essentially water, then if we're out of balance in our intentions, it's within the realm of possibility that our intentions can impact the entire planet and beyond in a destructive way. As our creator, the eternal Tao, might put it, water of life am I poured forth for thirsty men. Do the Tao now. Drink water silently today, 
while reminding yourself with each sip to nourish others in the same life-flourishing ways that streams give to the animals and rain delivers to the plants. Note how many places water is there for you, serving you by flowing naturally. Say a prayer of gratitude for this life-sustaining, always-flowing substance. Here's a quote from Marcus Aurelius, the famous Roman emperor. The happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. Take care that you entertain no notions unsuitable to virtue and reasonable nature. And here's Mother Teresa. God does not command that we do great things, only little things with great love. There are no justified resentments. You hear people say this all the time. I have a right to be upset because of the way I've been treated. I have a right to be angry, hurt, depressed, sad, and resentful. Learning to avoid this kind of thinking is one of my top ten secrets for living a life of inner peace, success, and happiness. Anytime you're filled with resentment, you're turning the controls of your emotional life over to others to manipulate. I became aware of how powerful this lesson was many years ago while sitting in on a meeting of 12 people who were in a recovery group for alcoholism and drug addiction. All 12 of those people were accustomed to blaming others for their weaknesses, using almost any excuse as a rationale for returning to their self-defeating ways. On a poster hanging in the room were these words, In this group, there are no justified resentments. Regardless of what anyone would say to another group member, no matter how confrontational or ugly the accusations, each person was reminded that there are no justified resentments. You may need to consider whom you resent before you make your own choice about whether this is useful for you. Resentments give you an excuse to return to your old ways. This is what got you there in the first place. Why resentments are there? You may be familiar with a popular television show called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? If the contestant answers 15 multiple-choice questions, he or she wins a million dollars. Starting with a $100 question, the person in the hot seat answers five questions until reaching the $1,000 level. At this point, the person is guaranteed to leave with something. Then the questions increase in difficulty. If the contestant reaches $32,000, again, there's a guarantee of leaving with that amount. So there are two crucial levels to attain, the $1,000 level, which is achieved by answering five relatively simple questions, and the $32,000 level, which involves five increasingly difficult questions. I've just related details about this TV program to present the idea of the two levels that you must achieve in order to have a chance at the highest million-dollar level of awareness. The $1,000 level is one in which you can learn to leave blame behind in your life. If you don't do so, you're going to go home with nothing. Removing blame means never assigning responsibility to anyone for what you're experiencing. It means that you're willing to say, I may not understand why I feel this way, why I have this illness, why I have been victimized, or why I had this accident, but I am willing to say, without any guilt or resentment, that I own it. I live with it, and I am responsible for having it in my life. Why do this? If you take responsibility for having it, then at least you have a chance to also take responsibility for removing it or learning from it. If you're in some small way, perhaps unknown, responsible for that migraine headache or that depressed feeling, then you can go to work to remove it or discover what its message is for you. If, on the other hand, someone or something else is responsible in your mind, then of course you'll have to wait until they change for you to get better, and that is unlikely to occur. So at the $1,000 level, blame has to go. Otherwise, you go home with nothing and are unable to participate at the higher levels. You must be willing to pass a new test at the second critical level, the $32,000 question, which is the final obstacle you must face in order to move into the more exalted realm of self-actualization and higher consciousness, the million-dollar spiritual level, if you will. At this level, you must be willing to send the higher, faster energies of love, peace, joy, forgiveness, and kindness as your response to whatever comes your way. This is the start of the uncrowded extra mile, where you have only one love to give away. Someone says something to you that you find offensive, and rather than opting for resentment, you are able to depersonalize what you've just heard and respond with kindness. You would rather be right than kind. You have no need to make others wrong or to retaliate when you've been wronged. You do this for yourself. There's a Chinese proverb, if you're going to pursue revenge, you'd better dig two graves. Your resentments will destroy you. They are low energies. And along the extra mile, you'll only meet others who have fully grasped this concept.
The ones who haven't made it to this level are all back with the crowd who went out of the game long ago on an easier question, and most are still back there wondering why they keep going home with nothing. But I can assure you that they continue to blame others for their emptiness. First, you have to get past blame. Then you have to learn to send love to all rather than anger and resentment. The story is told of the enlightened master who always responded to outbursts of criticism, judgment, and ridicule with love, kindness, and peace. One of his devotees asked him how he could possibly be so kind and peaceful in the face of such disparaging invective. His response to the devotee was this question, If someone offers you a gift, and you do not accept that gift, to whom does the gift belong? The answer leads us to the extra mile. Ask yourself, why would I allow something that belongs to someone else to be a source of my resentment? As the title of a popular book says, What You Think of Me Is None of My Business. Able to perform miracles and attract miracles into your life, you have to purify this temple that you live in. And your temple, the temple that you live in, is something that was intended into this universe with perfection. And any energy that comes into it, like yesterday I demonstrated uh, the impact of aspartame and saccharin on the body. In 1,000 out of 1,000 cases in the eye of the eye, um, Hawkins describes how it doesn't make any difference whether the person knows or doesn't know. Whenever you put that artificial substance into your body, um, you are weakening your body. And letting go of addictions and letting go of the belief that these are things that have more power over you than you have to let go of them is one of the energy levels below that calibrates below 200. It isn't spirituality in this, con in this presentation here today is not about what church you attend and what, uh, what scriptures you read. It's about how you stay connected to the perfection from which you were intended in the very first place. And I'd like you to really understand that. And when you do, you'll understand that anything that you do that is self-defeating to this temple, as the Sufis used to say, if you don't have a temple in your heart, you'll never find your heart in a temple. And it's about having a temple in your heart. It's about staying connected. And when you do, exercise becomes a regular part of your life. It's a spiritual experience. The foods that you eat become a spiritual experience. The music that you listen to becomes a spiritual experience. The books that you allow into your home, the programs that you allow to be on your television set, the kinds of ideas that you read in newspapers, so it's this force and counterforce thing. Now, as individuals, we understand when the World Trade Center was hit, um, our first impact, our first inclination was to be kind. What can we do? And you saw people donating blood. We had more blood donated in the first few hours after that than they, they had to st tell people to stop doing it. They had people getting into their fire trucks in Iowa and driving them all the way to Manhattan. They had people going into burning buildings and taking people out. Our whole sense of compassion, because compassion is one of the highest energy levels that you can reach. It, it calibrates around 470. That when you have compassion in your heart, for those who are operating or living at lower levels. And I remember the story that I heard shortly after the World Trade Center disaster, and it was of grandfather talking to his grandson. And the grandson was looking up at his grandpa, and his grandpa said, you know, he said, I feel as if I have two wolves barking inside of me. He said, the first wolf is filled with anger and hatred and bitterness and mostly revenge. And then he said, I have a second wolf barking inside of me who is filled with love and kindness and compassion and even forgiveness. And the grandson looked up at his grandpa and said, which wolf do you think will win, grandpa? And his grandfather responded, whichever one I feed. And we have to look at what we feed internally in ourselves.
when Einstein reminded us that until we come up with an alternative to using force as a way of resolving our disputes, we are doomed as a people to destroy ourselves. We'll destroy ourselves. The weapons that we have put aside in order to resolve our disputes cannot even be used because if we explode them and the wind changes, it blows back on us the very thing that we are attempting to put onto our enemies. How can we look upon all that we've done or failed to do and view it through the lens of our magnificence, especially when we've been trained to feel shame and self-reproach as a result of our perceived failures or flaws? We've all reacted to situations in the past in ways that we wouldn't want to today. I personally have done many things that I wouldn't choose to repeat, yet every recovering or recovered addict looks back with gratitude for the experience that brought him or her to a higher, more loving, sober place. As I've said in other places, true nobility is not about being better than someone else. It's about being better than you used to be. Every single experience in my life, right up to this day, was something I needed to go through in order to get to be here now, writing these words. What proof can I offer for this assertion? It happened. That's all the proof I need. As we look back on our life, we failed at nothing. All we've done is produce some results. It's imperative that we send love to those who were hurt by us and forgiveness to ourselves to heal our inner agony. We can then view it all as what we needed to experience in order to get to a higher place. One thing I've learned in my 65 years is that virtually every spiritual advance I've made toward a higher, closer alignment with God energy has been preceded by some kind of a fall from grace. Such mistakes, in quote, mistakes, in quote, allow me to write and speak from a more compassionate stance. That is, they always seem to provide me with the energy to propel myself to a higher place. Truly, I bless all of these failures, in quotes, because I know I needed to go there in order to get here. Be gentle and forgiving with yourself. Abandon any and all shame and refuse to engage in any self-repudiation. Instead, learn from Leo Tolstoy, who said that the most difficult thing, but an essential one, is to love life to love it even while one suffers, because life is all, life is God, and to love life means to love God. So love life, every moment of it, especially your blunder-filled past. Dr. Abraham Maslow, perhaps the most influential person in my life many years ago, what is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. Consider how you might want to follow his advice. You can never be mediocre because you are magnificent in every way. So seek ways to change your awareness of yourself so that you're fully aware of your magnificence and can become receptive to inspiration, your ultimate calling. Our life must be open to Spirit's guidance in order for us to feel inspired. When the calendar becomes frenzied, full of unnecessary turbulence because we fail to simplify, we won't be able to hear those long-distance calls from our source, and we'll slip into stress, anguish, and even depression. So whatever it takes to feel joy, we simply must act upon it. Regardless of our current station in life, we have a spiritual contract to make joy our constant companion. So we must learn to make a conscious choice to say no to anything that takes us away from an inspired life. This can be done gently, while clearly showing others that this is how we choose to live. We can start by turning down requests that involve actions that don't correspond with our inner knowing about why we're here. Even at work, we can find ways to keep ourselves on an inspirational agenda. For example, during my years as a college professor, I recall being asked over and over to partake in activities that didn't correspond with my own inspiration. So I devised a simple solution. I took on more teaching assignments, and in exchange, my colleagues attended curriculum meetings, served on research committees, and wrote building improvement reports. I consistently listened to my heart, which always demanded joy. Keep in mind that it's only difficult or impossible to accomplish joy when we engage in resistant vibrational thinking. If we know that we don't have to live a life stuffed with non-joyful activities, then we can choose the way of inspiration. Opting for joy involves giving ourselves time for play instead of scheduling a workaholic nightmare. We deserve to feel joy. It's our spiritual calling. By giving ourselves free time to read, to meditate, to exercise, and walk in nature, we're inviting the guidance that's waiting patiently to come calling 
with inspirational messages. The bottom line here is that we can simplify life by cutting down on the busy work that keeps us off purpose. We must curtail such activities and listen to spirit, staying aware of joy and how simple it is to access. On the fateful day of September 11, 2001, what stuck in my mind were the cell phone calls made by the people on the ill-fated planes. Every single call was made to a loved one to connect back in love or to express final words of love. No one called the office or asked their stockbroker for a final appraisal of their financial status. As relationships that weren't love-based didn't enter the thoughts of those who knew they were leaving this physical world, their top priority was to be certain to close out their lives in love. Tell the kids that I love them. I love you. Give mom and dad my love. Just as love is the priority in the final moments of life, so it must be as we simplify life now. We can go toward a clearer life by examining and purifying our relationships with those we love, with ourselves, and with God. What we're looking for are connections that keep us in an energy of love, which is the highest and fastest energy in the universe. But cultivating the witness is an interesting thing, and, and what I want to say to you about this is that it's like, it's where you begin to step outside and no longer identify yourself with the outer, and, and all that your senses tell you, and begin to reprogram this subconscious mind of yours, which is what does almost all of the uh, activities of your life, the subconscious mind. You know, your conscious mind thinks about things, like when you're learning to drive. It says, you know, put the foot on the brake and then slow it down and turn this and slow it and you do this and, you know, put your signal on and, and, <clears throat> and endless kinds of things that, uh, that go through the conscious mind until ultimately the subconscious mind gets all of the suggestions and then you drive, your subconscious mind takes you where you want to go. You see a red light, you stop. You don't say... Red, right foot, better put it on the right, better slow. You don't do any of that. But even you sitting, all of you sitting right here in this room, you know, you got here, you sit down, nobody told you how to sit, where to put your hands, how to do this, you know, how to listen. You just do all of this subconsciously. Your subconscious mind gets programmed all the time. And the witness is where you want to be able to step outside and look at what it is that you have trained your subconscious mind to do. Now, I wrote a whole book about this called Excuses Be Gone, about retraining this habitual mind of yours that does nothing but continuously have you redo the same things over and over and over again, where you want to learn to just walk a different way in your life. And, re and the way that you do this is by starting to witness what it is that you're doing. And one of the suggestions I give to everyone at my talks is this... Uh, to recognize that the, the last five minutes of your day before you go to sleep at night are five of the most important minutes that you live all day long. Because this is the time when you are preparing your subconscious mind, which is most comfortable with, its, with your unconscious mind. Your subconscious mind learns the most when it is in its unconscious state, in your sleep state. So as you're about to go into sleep and your mind is busy, doing all of the kinds of things that it does, you are really preparing the universe to offer you up experiences that match up to whatever you're placing into your subconscious mind. And this is a hard concept for people to get, but this is how the, this is how the world works. This is how the universe works. And I suggest to you that you don't spend the last five minutes of your day reviewing all of the things that you don't like and all of the things that you don't want, and all of the people that upset you, and all of the hurts that you have, and all of the reasons that you're not, things are not going well, and all of your illnesses, and all of the things that you can't do, and how sorry you feel for yourself, and all of the... You don't want to do that because you're about to marinate for the next eight hours in your unconscious mind, which is most comfortable with your subconscious mind, and then when you awaken, you see your subconscious not mind cannot make a distinction between what you're thinking about and what you're experiencing in your day and in your life. It just says, if you're thinking it, that must be what you want, and I'll just offer you up experiences that match up to what you're thinking. So you want to be really careful as you go off to sleep at night 
to make sure that you are placing into your subconscious mind, which is about to enter its unconscious state, only that which you want to materialize and manifest tomorrow morning when you awaken and throughout the entire day. And so many people make the mistake of using the last five minutes before they enter into this eight-hour marinating period by going over the things that they don't like, that they don't want, that shouldn't have happened, that really upset them, and so on. You want to make the shift. This is from the book of Job. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering in their, in their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. Then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction while they are slumbering in their beds. Job 33, verses 15 and 16. So while you're sleeping, you're getting instructions. But first you've got to place it in your mind and then experience it and witness it. And as you go to sleep at night, you witness everything working out perfectly. I am healthy. I'm going to be walking. I'm going to be in a divine relationship. I'm going to be, you know, attracting the right prosperity. I'm going to have divine relationships with everyone I encounter. I'm going to have the most marvelous day tomorrow. I'm going to help 25 people. Whatever it is, you just place into your imagination, feel what that feels like, and then go off to sleep and receive your instructions. Cultivate the witness. Your body has limits to how fast it can go and how far it can go. They're expansive and grand. They're much greater than you've ever thought they were. There are boundaries in form, but in thought... In that invisible world that I'm talking about, there are no boundaries except what you choose to think. You can think anything. And anything that you can think is here already in the dimension of thought. It's already here. I'm going to stop relating to the people in my life just my form to their form. I'm going to start getting behind their form to that divine intelligence that's there. What are they thinking? And how can I have a no-limit relationship with everybody in my life? Instead of relating to the place where there are limits, their bodies, their forms, their performance level, I'm going to relate to what's in back of that. What kind of attitudes do they have? How do they think? I'm going to look at that side of them. That's what Mother Teresa talks about in the streets of Calcutta. She sees God in every one of those starving children and the lepers. She sees the divineness that's there. She doesn't just relate to the form. She relates to who is that human being in back of that form. What is that divineness there? You don't have to be Mother Teresa in the streets of Calcutta catering to the most sorrowful among us. You can do that every place in your life. You can stop just seeing the world in terms of what you see and what you can get a hold of and start living in that invisible part and back of that where divineness really resides. That's in all of us. Whoever you are, wherever you go in the world, every single human being you meet, whether it's a tribesman in Afghanistan whether it's a Sherpa guide in Nepal, whether it's a taxi driver in Tokyo, or a tribesman in New Guinea, or a salesman in Detroit, you share something with that person. What you share is what it's like to be human. We all share that with each other. And you know, and they know, what it's like to hurt inside, what it's like to feel lonely, what it's like to experience pain, or to experience exhilaration or happiness. We all, as human beings, and those are all thoughts, those all come from thought, we share thought together with all human beings. And if we remembered that, if we tuned into that part of people, whether we're running a business or a family or whatever, if we started relating to people there instead of just to their form, and when you see an angry person or you see a happy person, what you're looking at is what created that and what kind of thoughts do they have and relate to their thought, relate to the divineness in them, whoever they are the whole world would be better, and so would your business. It's understanding that no one is any better than anybody else in God's eyes. See, it doesn't matter what you call that universal intelligence. The name doesn't matter. It's just as good a word as any in God's eyes, and that universal intelligence that's permeating all form, all of the rest of it is just trappings. It doesn't really matter. When it gets right down to it, we all share humanity with each other. We're all part of the being called human being, each one of us. In reading the literature of the East particularly, in preparation for my book, you'll see it when you believe it, I would find that over and over I would see references to this thing called the observer. I'd say the observer. And one 
particular group of people would have written about it, and then it would show up in Buddhism, and it would show up in Hinduism, and it would show up in practice of Zen and in Kundalini. And it just kept showing up, this observer, the observer. And I wasn't quite sure what it was, what it meant. And then I began to realize that it's something I've done all my life, only they were just putting it into words. It's really a technique that I find myself using over and over again. The best way to think of it is, like Shakespeare said, the whole world is a stage, and we are all but actors on that stage. When you start to look at it that way, you begin to see yourself as having a lot of roles to play. And they really are roles. And we're all out there playing these roles. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm not authentic at all. I'm not talking about authenticity. Each one of these things are very real, but they are still roles that we're playing. So what you have to do is sort of remind yourself that you're doing that and not take all of this whole stage so seriously and make it so dramatic and so significant and important. It's like lightening you up a little bit. And the observer is like whoever this guardian angel or this invisible person is. You can sort of catch yourself whenever you find yourself getting out of control or getting mad at the fact that there's a delay at the airport or that the traffic isn't going the way you want it to. That invisible guardian angel, that I that can be in back of you, can put the skids on that right away. That person can say, I'm watching you. I'm watching your form. You know, Lily Tomlin had a great line. She said, how come when you talk to God, it's called praying? But when God talks to you, it's called schizophrenia. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but that God talking to you can be that invisible part of you. Then you start connecting to that. And then I find myself, wherever I am in my life, whatever I'm doing, in back of myself, on my shoulder or whatever, and reminding me, how should you react to this? Send love here. A lot of people think that other things make them the way they are. They will blame their past, they'll blame their parents, they'll blame the economy, they'll blame the Ayatollah, they'll blame somebody for things that are going wrong in their life. And one of the favorite things that we have to blame for why I'm upset at a particular moment is something called traffic. Traffic made me upset. And I've always reminded myself when I'm in a jam or when I'm on the freeway and I'm trying to get someplace, that traffic doesn't care that you have within you the opportunity in this moment to really work on these things that are perhaps debilitating or, or creating anxiety or stress in your life, that these are tests, these are opportunities for you. Traffic doesn't care. Your anger is your choice, and you can always choose to be, to be at happy, angry, depressed, miserable, upset, or you can choose to be fulfilled and do something positive in this moment. It's always up to you. And if you can just give up your personal history, just like, just let the whole thing go and, and pay attention. And when, it, when I th thought about that, yesterday I went for a swim, um, and, uh, which I do every day, but this was, uh, it was after doing this seminar with, uh, with Eckhart. And I, <clears throat> and I noticed that I was m more in the moment in that swim than any, any swim I've, I've done in the last several years. And I swim virtually every single day for, at sunset for about an hour. Um, in the ocean, and um, and I, I just <clears throat> I was I was in every stroke, and every t every t every time I would look down with the goggles on, I what, what, whatever you see, whether you see fish or you see turtles or you just see, you know, rocks or trash or whatever it is that you see, it was like the it was um, it was almost like the transcendence of time and just getting past it and just really immersing yourself into that present moment and. And the second thing, of course, is in addition to paying attention, um, because as, as you pay attention, I mean, as I was swimming and I would look up, I would, I, I, I've done the same route for for years and years on Kanapali Beach here in Maui. <clears throat> I would look up and I, there was a tree, and it was I, I noticed there was a tree next to a building there that in probably 10 years of swimming, I've never seen that tree before. Uh, and I must have walked by it 10,000 times if I've not walked by it once. Uh, but I really never noticed the, uh, and I just, as I was swimming, I stopped swimming for a moment and I just became like one with this tree. And it's like, it was, uh, it was such a, a whole new experience. It was, uh, it was really very, very beautiful. And then the other thing is to be astonished, you know, to just stay in that state of being bewildered. Like Rumi said, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. Just to be, ast be astonished at every breath you take, you know, be astonished at, uh, at, at who you are and that you're even alive that you were ever born and that that you're not this body that you're in and that you're this invisibleness and 
you know, be astonished by the cloud formations and the, you know, and the little bugs and <clears throat> the spiders and the sand and, and virtually everything. I had a great teacher that came into my life through his writing. His name was Nisargadatta Maharaj. He lived in India up until the mid-1980s. And he wrote something called I Am That, which was very powerful and influential in my life. And one of the things that he talked about when he was asked the question, what's the difference between, say, a saint or a highly functioning human being, a spiritual master, a spiritual teacher, and the rest of us? Is that they have unconditional love in them, and you don't, or we don't? And he said, no. He said, saints have unconditional love in them, and so do you. He said, the difference between ordinary human awareness and higher awareness people is that they have nothing else inside of them. That's all they have. And it's almost like we have to learn how to get that in ourselves. To be able to, well, I always like to use a metaphor of an orange. I love the orange. Perhaps living in Florida is why, but. <laughs> an orange is a simple metaphor. You take this orange and you squeeze it as hard as you can squeeze it. And you ask yourself, what will come out? And what comes out when you squeeze an orange? Orange juice. Never, no matter how many times you squeeze it, will apple juice come out. There's no mistakes. You'll never get grapefruit juice out of this thing, ever. The only thing you'll ever get out of it is orange juice. And the next question is why? Why when you squeeze an orange, as hard as you can squeeze it, does orange juice come out? And I asked that question up in Toronto one time, there's a little girl sitting right in the front row. She said, that's dumb. <laughs> it's a, it, she said, that's what's inside. It has to come out. I said, well, that's the answer. <laughs> you are really smart. And she smiled and she thought that was great. But that's the truth. The reason that orange juice comes out when you squeeze it is because that's what's inside. Now you extend the metaphor and someone squeezes you. That is, someone says something about you that you don't like. Someone behaves towards you in a way that you find offensive. Somebody does something or says something to you that you feel hurt by. And out of you comes anger, hatred, bitterness, tension, fear, anxiety, stress. And immediately you say, the reason that comes out of me is because of how he said it, or the way that she said that, or because they did that. But the truth is, the reality is, that what comes out is what's inside. And if you don't like what's inside, you can change it. Now, if you ask me, how does orange juice get inside of an orange, I would say, I don't know. I can't figure it out. That's a mystery to me. I just enjoy the oranges of my life and give God the credit for that. You can attract to yourself what you desire. The central notion of manifesting is the understanding that you have within yourself the ability to attract the objects of your desire. Being able to attract your desires may seem more likely when you consider how things move from the world of the formless into the world of the form. In one of the most intriguing sentences in the New Testament, St. Paul addresses this process of creation. He says it this way, Things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. St. Paul is telling us that the creative energy is neither solid nor restricted. The physical world of form originates in something other than the form itself. St. Paul's words form the basis for my writing about this principle and for several of those to come in this tape. I believe they suggest how energy informs our ability to attract what we desire. St. Paul is giving us a clue about bringing our desires into the world of matter. Energy then becomes a force that we can tap into. In a film about his boyhood, Albert Einstein describes picking up a compass and watching it in fascination as the needle moved when he changed direction. He said that he became obsessed with understanding the invisible force that moved the compass needle. Where was the force located? Who controlled it? Why did it always work? Like magnetism, there is a force that has many characteristics that are quite impossible to detect with our physical senses. We call this force energy. Energy is in all things in our universe and has an impact upon objects around it with something that we describe as the power of attraction. 
In magnetic fields, we can easily see it at work, yet we're unable to detect the formless energy with our sensory apparatus. The force is there, attracting and repelling, and it is everywhere on our planet. If it is everywhere, then it is also within us. It seems unlikely that our senses will inform us any better than they help us comprehend how a magnetic pole works. We can see the results, but the force itself is always elusive and in motion. The essence of this fourth principle of manifesting is that we can utilize this energy because we are this energy. We can use this universal energy to bring to us objects of our desire because the same energy that is in what we desire is also in us and vice versa. It is simply a matter of alignment and will that allows us to tap into this force. Bringing things into the physical world is a process that we call creation. What we create involves the use of the same power that is in all that is created. It is only a matter of degree. There is absolutely no difference in the power that brings something from the world of waves into the world of particles and the power that brings your thoughts or mental pictures into form. I encourage you to listen to this again and again and commit it to memory. The world of spirit from which all matter derives and the world of matter comprise one harmonious whole. They are separate but always together, just like the peak of the wave and its base, separate but forming an inseparable whole. Think of manifesting as nothing more than transforming waves of possibility into particles of reality. The transforming process requires energy. This energy is invisible but is always in everything, including us. Your mental pictures are related to this power of attraction. There is a power within you that allows you to form a thought or a picture. This mental picturing power is the energy of attraction that is in all creative processes. It is different in degree, but nevertheless identical with the power of attraction. This power is the very substance of life. You can't see, touch, or hear this power, but it is within you. In using this power, you are not in any way attempting to change or interfere with the laws of nature. You are fulfilling the laws. This undifferentiated power is the basis for the mysterious attraction that draws your desires to you. Think of yourself as a way that God has of particularizing. Then see your ability to formulate mental pictures as the divine creative power energizing through you. Can you see that the same creative energy that particularizes as yourself is what you use to manifest your desires? This power thrives on happiness, love, joy, contentment, and peace. The more blissful and loving you are, the more the Divine Spirit particularizes within you and the more godlike you become. It is through your thoughts, or how you use your power to create a thought, that all creative energy is attracted to you. If your mental pictures are of being surrounded by things and conditions that you desire, and they are rooted in joy and faith, your creative thoughts will attract these surroundings and conditions into your life. The power to even have a thought is a divine power. With this recognition of its sacredness, you form a vision or a mental picture. Finally, you hold it lovingly in place with the inner knowledge that the God force that brought everything in the universe into existence also created you. The form that this energy will take will be controlled and directed by your will or your mental picturing. It is waiting to take any direction you decide. You impress upon the universal mind the object of your desire and you calmly and knowingly proceed to act upon that picture, allowing the greater intelligence and your own, which is a part of that greater intelligence, to work through you to produce the results. You abandon all fear and return to the affairs of your life, assured that the necessary conditions will soon come into view or are already there. The key is to repeat the mental pictures until the truth of what you are affirming resonates within you without an ounce of doubt and there will be times when it appears that it isn't working. If your picture doesn't manifest in the time span that you've designated, relax and retreat to your knowing that it is already in place in the spiritual realm. Time is simply not a recognizing feature of the all-creating wisdom. 